Well, hello there and welcome to the recording of another episode of Marketing Scoop, the SEO Rush podcast. Um, this time we're going to be recording episode number 26 of season two. We're going to give people a few minutes just to join. Um, so um, as people join us live, uh, make sure that you are subscribed to the audio podcast as well. So the audio podcast. Um, the information about that can be seen at seumrush.com slash podcast. You can um, have access to the shows as soon as they're published in audio form, mildly edited. This uh, particular introduction won't be available in the audio podcast. Um, so if you don't like this, then the audio podcast is where you need to go. Um, so as I said, seumrush.com slash podcast, and you can follow the links there to iTunes, Android, and all other flavors of podcatchers that tend to be particular, particularly popular. So we've got a few people starting to watch us live now. If you're watching us live, howdy. Um, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us live. Uh, it'll be great to have your comments as part of this show. As I said, we're recording an audio podcast, but um, when we see your comments, when we see your questions in relation to what's going on, we try and incorporate them as part of the show. Um, so say hi as part of the chat um, just now. Say, um, tell us, uh, where in the world you're joining us from and tell us a little bit about your background and what maybe interests you about this particular topic which is going to be what is your content marketing research process but just before we get going properly Judith uh, what's been happening in the world in the news perhaps of digital marketing this week I think one of the biggest stories has got to be Google dropping all sorts of websites or web pages out of their index and there seemed to be no rhyme or reason to it it just happened and it's still not fully resolved. Most people, when they discovered um, through massive drops in traffic and sales that they actually had had pages de-indexed through a technical bug, not through any problems like they weren't uh, link building or spamming or anything like that, you know, not what I would do, clearly. <laughs> but um, they were just dropped out of the index. Now they've, um, Dr. Pete Myers, I think it is, Dr. Pete, mm -hmm. Dr. Pete, uh, estimated about 4% of the index had just vanished overnight on Thursday, and it's still not completely back in yet. So if you are seeing massive drops since Thursday, it could be you just need to go into Webmaster. Um, uh, it's Google Search Console, not Webmaster Tools anymore. And just um, get Google to recrawl those pages that seem to have disappeared, and they'll pop right back in. It's not a penalty. It's not nothing. It's just a bug. So. That's scary, though. It's um, so it's not something that Google are automatically doing. They're keeping to their existing crawl patterns, as far as you're aware. They're not doing any special crawls to try and re-index anything that might have disappeared. No, because it's a bug with the index. So things have been dropped that were unintentionally, and okay. so when you do ping it, um, it's it's within a matter of minutes that things are back in. So uh, they are aware of the fact that this bug has happened and that people have lost you know, thousands as a result of it. But um, so they're working to re recover, so to speak, the lost pages, but there is, they're not doing any additional crawling. They can't because the crawler learns uh, from server uptimes and server speed, how much uh, your site can take. So if it all of a sudden starts hammering everybody again, really quickly, it could take sites down. So they're sticking with their normal crawl patterns, but they are um, speedily working on this bug. Scary stuff. And it certainly shows you the necessity, um, if you're an SEO, to keep on track of everything and um, to have those alerts set up uh, to be aware of when any kind of um, significant drops in traffic or um, other issues occur. And then you're going to be alerted to it quickly and you'll be able to um, recover your situation more quickly than, than other websites out there. Absolutely, yeah. And of course, content mm. is important. Content's key. And that's what we're talking about today. Indeed. Yeah. Um, we're get, we'll get started just now um, to record the, the actual podcast um, episode just now. So um, here we go. And um, this is the, the real introduction. Marketing Scoop Season 2, Episode 26. What is your content marketing research process? Broadcasting live in the SEM Rush YouTube channel, this is Marketing Scoop. I'm David Bain. And I'm Judith Lewis. And welcome to the SEM Rush show that reveals the latest digital trends and technologies that impact your marketing strategy. 
Together with industry experts, we delve into SEO advertising and content marketing to uncover the ultimate recipe for digital marketing success. So the first of today's guests is a podcaster, a speaker, and a SaaS founder who offers a money-back guarantee on his free email newsletter. Hello and welcome to the founder of thepodcasthost.com, Colin Gray. Hey, David. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us, Colin. Next That's up, right. <laughs> next up, a lady who regularly speaks about search, social, and branding at top marketing conferences, including SMX, Search Love, and PubCon. Welcome to the Senior Director of Digital Marketing at Co-Marketing, Casey Gillette. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you very much for joining us. Now, I'd like to stick with you, Casey, first. So how do you go about researching the content that you intend to publish? Yeah, when I when I got the topic for this, I thought, oh, gosh, like, where do you even start? <laughs> right? Because that's the problem that we all face. Um, but I think the biggest thing that we have to start with is you have to ask yourself, what's the goal? Right? What is the goal of your content? because that's going to change your research. So, you know, for us, a lot of the content that we're writing here is for our clients. Um, it's typically for search purposes, right? So inevitably that goes back to looking at the search results, looking at our keywords, um, and that's typically where we'll start is what is this for, right? Like, what is this actually for? Now, if we're writing something for social, that's much different and our goal is much different and I don't necessarily care about my keywords as much or maybe what the search results look like right? because that that just determines what we're doing um, but I do think you know it always goes back to your audience um, you know if it is for search you know the first thing I'll do is take a look and see what what are my what does my audience actually want um, and that's using tools like, you know, answer the public and keyword tool and SEM rush, right? The, the questions and buzz sumo, I can start to see what are people actually asking? Um, that, that's become a really big part of our process here is thinking about what does your audience actually want? Um, right? Because we get into the, let's just create content. That's what we're supposed to do. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, so I think that that's surely the starting point. But the same thing can apply to social, right? Let's say I'm creating content for social. I still need to look and see what are people talking about? What are they asking about on social? Um, you know, what is my audience actually like? Um, and then, you know, some of those same tools, BuzzSumo and SEMrush, and I can see, like, I just think that that understanding your audience piece has to be the thing that we do. Talking about understanding your audience, um, we've got some a few people saying hi in the chat live watching us online. Um, we've got uh, Dog Parents online. We've got Pineapple Crush Me. Um, I think we're having a competition to um, have the most unusual name watching us live. Um, whatever name you happen to be, hi, if you're watching us live. Um, and if you've got questions, then please um, ask them in the chat in relation to to what we're chatting about. Um, Casey, just one follow up question. Um, you were talking about your know, the tools that you use and um, your audience as well. Um, do you actually look at the the quantity of searches that um, a keyword has um, when deciding on what topic to write, or is it most important just to select a topic that is hyper relevant to your audience? Yeah, so I mean, we have, for all of our clients, we have a core set of keywords. But when you've been writing for somebody for three years or, you know, whatever it might be, like, you can only <laughs> say so much about that single keyword. So we try to look at it more holistically. So yes, that, that core keyword might have a higher search volume, but we're really looking at like the entities, right? What are all of the things that make up this keyword? Um, and what are the questions tied to those? Now, if I go into search results and I see, hey, I found this topic, I throw it in there, and there's nothing coming up even tied to that, okay, maybe this isn't what we're actually looking for, right? Maybe this isn't something that I want to write. So I think it's a balance. Um, the challenge is when you get into some of these tools and you get into those longer tail terms, you're not going to see anything, right? You're not going to see that search volume. So I need to go back and see 
where are people asking this question? Um, you know, what are the search results showing? Like a lot of times, you know, we'll go in, um, I'm a huge fan of like BuzzSumo's question analyzer that they have. But what I like about it is it'll break things up into topics for you. So I can see like, let's say I have the, one of the examples that I always use is like golf balls. Now, I probably am not just gonna target golf balls that's really competitive, really hard. But what it will do is break it out into themes like used golf balls. And I can see all of the questions that people are asking around that. And I can see how frequently those questions are coming up in these different places. So I like to look at it more from that part, a little bit more holistically than just the volume itself. But obviously that matters. Colin, so writing. It's, sorry, go for it, Judith. I was going to say, so writing content over three years, it seems to be quite oh challenging gosh. to continue with um, targeting content over and over and over again for something like a golfing site <laughs> to go with the golf ball example, because there is a limited amount of content that you can write that's not necessarily news or topical around the masters or something like that. So you're looking at questions. Do you, do you ever look at things like people also ask with regards yeah. to answering questions for your clients? Yeah, I love that. Like some of the suggested searches. Um, the other thing too that you have to do is we actually talk to our clients. Um, you know, one of the things is we try to find out, you know, I think there's all, there's always this breakdown between like marketing and support or marketing and sales. And you can get some really fantastic stuff there. Uh, so for some of our clients, like we have access to like their live chat tool to see what are the things that people are asking about. Um, but we also will do interviews. Like we do a lot of content interviews with like the subject matter experts within the organizations to ask them, what are you getting? Right? What are the types of things that people are asking you? What are some of the issues that we're hearing? Um, same thing with sales and support. Because yeah, it gets really boring to <laughs> keep saying the same thing. Um, and you know, the whole purpose of this conversation is that coming up with new ideas is really hard. Um, so you know, the more that we have, the better. But yeah, taking a look at those suggested searches, taking a look at you know the people also ask boxes. Um, a lot of times when we're thinking about like, okay, we want to address some of the questions that are coming up in like the answer box. Well, that is fantastic material because that almost always gives you the people also ask box as well. And then you just start expanding that, and it's like content gold. Like I love that. <laughs> We've got Yosef Silver saying in the chat, great ideas in terms of tools and content discovery. Um, so that's obviously in relation to what you've been sharing there, Casey. Colin, um, he's also asked, uh, Yosef has also asked a question saying, uh, how far out do you recommend planning content? Um, what's your process yourself? How far into the future do you actually go when you're planning your content? We plan pretty far, actually. So um, it's Matthew and I here in the office that do most of our content. We have some guest writers, but we do the bulk of it. And we tend to sit down once a quarter and just think out topics. We put out probably, uh, on average, about three items a week. So we generally come up with, what would that be, 12 weeks times three? So 36 topics. That's about what we come up with every quarter. So um, what are we now? We're just going into April. So we were just about to do our next quarter's worth of planning. But three months ago, we actually planned out those 36 topics for January, February, March. Um, and that works quite well for us. We do, I mean, just... Um, Yosef says they're around planning for seasonality or variations and stuff. And we do for that. So we have it, we basically, what we do is we come up with our 36 topics, we put them all into Trello, which is what we use for our content calendar. Um, just the calendar view in Trello, that uh, power up you can get. And then we think about, um, we basically map them all out, but it makes it really easy to move them. So if we come up with a good topic, something that's news bound or something that's a bit more timely or just something we're being asked around a lot right now, we'll just slot that in and move the other things down a little bit. So yeah, that's kind of how we plan it out and how we, how we deal with those variations long time. And how do you actually go about selecting the type of content um, that matches up with the various topics that you select? There's a few different levels we go at. So um, it was mentioned already, talk to your customers. So that's actually where we get a lot of our uh, content ideas. We're lucky enough that we've got a, a fair bit of traffic on our site these days. We've got a lot of people signing up to our mailing list. And on our mailing list, 
every single person that signs up for our newsletter, within the first two weeks, they get an email from us with a simple question, nothing more than, hey, how's your day? Uh, what are you struggling with in your podcasting right now? And that is just a simple question that we ask people. And because it's so simple, so easy, so kind of short, we get tons of answers to that. So we get something around 50 to 60 people a day signing up, and then we'll get maybe a third of them actually responding to this. So we get loads of responses to this. And we tend to get the same stuff over and over again. So we get the really common ones that we get asked a lot, but we get some variations of it. Maybe we can break off some articles, um, but we do get new stuff. Every day we get something new that we can write about. So we're never short of topics that way. Uh, but I realize that that is something for kind of later in a content creator's uh, life cycle because you need to have an audience at that point already. When I'm thinking about, when I'm working with new podcasters, thinking about topics, I always go with, actually to start with, I always go with the the big five um, topics. I don't know if you know, uh, Marcus Sheridan wrote about it ages ago, but a lot of other people talk about it as well. And it's, if I can remember them all, it's uh, cost is always the big one. Uh, problems, you've got uh, comparisons, best of lists and reviews. So I find that if you write down those five headers and then you just spend 10 minutes on each header and you just think about questions related to that in your topic, you can come up with some great stuff. And often the things that are most commonly asked about, those are the five topics that people most commonly search. Um, to give a few examples, uh, with cost, that first one, some of our one of our best performing articles is how much does it cost to run a podcast? It's as general and as wide as that, and that does really well. Uh, with problems, you get something like, um, why is my Skype call not working very well? Or, you know, why is my microphone hissing? Stuff like that, just problems that happen. Uh, comparisons always work well. We get things like uh, dynamic versus condenser microphones. A bit geeky, but people that are interested in mics and audio recording, they love that stuff. Uh, with best of, that always works well for us. So we've got like best microphones, best mixers, best recorders, best podcast software, best podcast apps. They always work great. And then finally, reviews. You just pick a, pick a topic, pick a product, um, like review the, the po Rode Podcaster mic right in front of us and do that Rode pro, uh, Podcaster review. And that works well too. So I find that's a great way if you're early stage and even later stage too, but you can brainstorm tons of good topics using that structure. And do you look at the keyword volumes in relation to certain keyword phrases or is the most important thing for you just dealing with the topic um, as effectively as possible for the audience that you have in mind? Yeah, no, I do. Yeah, I'm totally pragmatic about that in that we use the uh, Google keyword tool just to get volume um, in general, just to, it's just to prioritize really. I think if it's a topic that people are asking us about, I'm going to write about it at some point. We're going to write about it at some point, but we'll prioritize the most searched ones first. So absolutely, yeah, I use a few different tools for that, but Google Keyword Tools are a good starting point. One of the um, things that I've been wondering about listening to you talk about um, thinking about the different types of topics is also how you select your content format. Because I mean, we're, we're sort of assuming a little bit here textual content, but there's yeah. also, you know, audio video um, and, and, you know, in the future, maybe there'll be taste and smell too. <laughs> you never know. But um, how do you choose um, your content format? I tend to, I try to do them all every time and we don't do it every time, but the structure that I follow is that blog is our kind of front facing, uh, wide facing format. So that's where we get the most of our traffic because still that is the, the biggest search volume really is just blog, blog posts. Um, I mean, video is catching up, I like YouTube second biggest search channel still, is that right? Um, I remember hearing that at some point. So video is definitely a high search volume place, but it's harder to, you know, text is still a great place to stand out and get that kind of wide end of the funnel to get people in. So we always create a blog post for everything, pretty much. No, yeah, for everything, actually. Even when we create a podcast or a video post, we always put it into a blog post eventually. But for most every blog post I create, I'll also do a podcast episode and usually a video. 
So usually what we do is, um, and again, kind of lucky in that we've got a situation where I've got a permanent space set up, whereby I've got two microphones, I've got a, a, a camera set up, we've got a recorder just sitting there. So after I've written a blog post, either myself can go in solo or Matthew here as well, the two of us will go in there and we'll just record the topic. And the funny thing is, I think a lot of people say this, say that it's, it's a lot of work to do all three formats all at once. So to do a blog and a podcast and a video, but I find if I've just written a blog post, so I've just spent an hour, two hours researching this, creating it, I can create a really good tight little podcast episode based on that very quickly because I've just spent two hours thinking about it. So there's no more planning required. I've done the planning to plan out the blog post. Um, all I need to do is sit down and talk it through using the same bullet point plan I used for the blog post. Um, and it tends to not need that much editing, that much work either, because again, I've thought it all through. So you tend to be quite uh, coherent on it too. So that's our process. I tend to go blog first, then record straight away. And if I can, if I've got the facility to do it, I'll record a video of it at the same time, which means that I can put out the podcast episode too and um, take some highlights from that as a video and put out maybe a couple of two minute clips or a couple of five minute clips from that episode to the YouTube channel. Wow, that's a fantastic amount of work. But I guess, Casey, um, if we're thinking about clients and clients aren't always as useful <laughs> at doing everything for us as we would wish. Um, and I'm, I'm quite sure that um, uh, you've uh, encountered different obstacles than Colin who has a setup um, has. So when you're, when you're dealing with clients and whatnot, and you, you have to work with within their constraints, um, how do you choose if you, if you have to choose, cause they're going to make you, cause we know what clients are like. <laughs> We do, <laughs> so, you know, it varies, right? So, you know, I would love to create, you know, videos for all my clients. I would love for them to do podcasts. I would love for them to do, you know, social graphics, whatever it might be. We can't do that for everybody. Um, but I do think it goes back to what I mentioned earlier is what are we trying to accomplish? You know, especially when you work with clients, like, you only have so much money to work with, you only have so much time. And we're always trying to figure out, how do I get the biggest bang for my buck? Right? So, you know, it is a lot of blog content. I will say that, you know, it, to Colin's point, it's a lot of blog content because that's what drives search, right? At, at the end of the day for us, that's a lot of what drives search, a lot of educational materials. Um, but we'll look and see, like, if we have a client who's doing a webinar, for example, I have this one client that I just, I love what they do because they've really thought about, here's all of the things that we can actually do. Um, and so if they're having a webinar, we'll actually write, you know, a blog post ahead of time to promote it. Um, and we'll get that, once that webinar goes live, they'll take that blog post, we'll fill it in a little bit more to address some of the questions that were asked, make it like a more interesting piece, and then their sales team will email that out to all the people who registered, right? Because there's like 40% of people who register for a webinar show up or something. So that's a great way to get people in. And then they take the webinar, they'll chop it up and create these clips that they can put on YouTube, that they can put on social. And I just love that. I think it's a really interesting way to look at it, right? So, you know, we're helping them with some of that stuff. But you know, another thing that because we have a lot of B2B clients, you know, we're driving leads, right? Our goal is to drive leads. Um, and so we create a lot of ebooks and guides. And what I will say to that is when you think about those things, it sounds really overwhelming. Right? Like, I don't have the time to create a guide, I don't have the time to create an ebook. But if you've been creating content for a while, you probably already have that. And so just like Colin mentioned, like I've already spent two hours writing this post. It's fresh in my mind. I know it. Um, we actually just went to and created an ebook. Like I'm reviewing it as we speak from blog posts that we had created previously. Right. And now we're able to create this more comprehensive guide that looks nice. We can create social graphics around it. We can promote it out. Their sales team can use it. So you know, you got to work with what you have, <laughs> but, you know, just thinking about how can you really take advantage of the content that you already have when you are limited. We've got Casey Markey interacting in the chat as well. We've got um, two Casey's in the house, um, or perhaps even three. Maybe there's someone lurking as well. Has there ever been an occasion where there's been a live webinar with three Casey's in the house? Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but, um, we, we've we've had some great thoughts from you with regards to actually how you research content. Uh, it would be good to get a couple of thoughts on actually how to make a piece of content successful and how to get people interacting with that piece of content and drive traffic to that piece of content as well. Um, Colin, um, shall we go back to you and your thoughts with that? Um, what um, are the things that you have done to make a piece of content particularly successful? I think... I mean, my method for making content successful has always been 90% uh, oh, based on the research. It's around that question research. I mean, it, don't worry, I'm not copping out entirely. We'll go into a few things that I think you can do. But I think it's just important to reiterate the fact that the research we talked about earlier is most of the job, I think, in making it successful. I, we've never done a whole lot of content promotion Um at the podcast host. Like we've generally just tried to pick the right topic up front, make sure it's got a bit of volume and then let it run. And actually over time, it's just, they've just, we've just grown traffic in that way. I think one thing you can do if you've already got a bit of co uh, content is to make sure you're thinking about that internal linking as much as possible. And I'm, we are struggling with this these days because we've got uh, about 600 odd blog posts on the website and managing to go back and make sure you're funneling people from place to place around your website. I think that's really important, not just for the search rankings, but, you know, usability and making sure people are um, finding the right content and, and um you know, I think it does it does help your search rankings as well. If you're thinking about those those pillar posts that you're linking towards as well. I did a really big restructure recently, actually, where I picked out 10 to 15 pillar posts and sort of linked through to them from all of the, the sub posts. And that's made a big difference, actually, to our traffic, not just to uh, dwell time, like how many, how long people are staying on the site, not just to page views, but to our overall um, inbound traffic. So I'm not sure if that was why exactly, but it's coincidental if it wasn't. So yeah, I, I'll say that the one thing that hasn't ever worked for us that people always promote is social media. I, we've just never managed to make it work in terms of promoting content on social media. You know, you always hear the uh, promote every blog post you do, put it out three times on Twitter, then twice on Instagram, then once on Facebook and all this kind of stuff. I have tried every variation of that over the years and I've never managed to get much traffic from social at all. Maybe just because I'm not doing it right, but it doesn't work for us. Um, so I hope that's a, a few tips in there at least. Do you, uh, if you publish a piece of content that you think is going to be a pillar of content for perhaps years to come, and yeah. you've spent more time producing that piece of content than other, other pieces of content, do you have a yes. launch strategy for that piece of content? I probably should, shouldn't I? <laughs> no, <laughs> to be frank. Um, my launch strategy is really, it's internal again. Uh, and it's something that we could definitely do more of is the outreach type marketing, like trying to make sure people are aware of these things going out and link building and stuff like that. It's just not something that I've ever put a lot of time into. I just make sure that if we're putting a lot of effort into one post, I spend half a day going through the site and making sure all of the related posts are linking to it. I make sure it appears prominently on our category pages. So I've put a lot of work into our category pages to make sure that um, we have a guide, for example, people land on uh, podcast production and we've got to start with these two posts. Here's the two pillar posts for content production, for example, podcast production. And then we go down to here's some other popular ones um, uh, and elsewhere in the site as well. Whenever we're talking about that, um, I make sure it's linking to that pillar post. So it's all internal, I have to admit, not enough external probably. Casey Markey is saying in the chat, good point about the social media promotion, same experience. So that's interesting. Um, so Casey, our guest, um, do you have any thoughts about that? And also we're getting a, we've had a question from Erez um, Elias saying, um, Casey, how do you promote your eBooks? Yeah, I mean, going back to social, um, I don't disagree. I actually, I had a client recently who, who just decided to cut their social team. Um, and I saw something on Twitter today about a big brand who, who was no longer answering culture support. I think there's a time and place. Um, I would say in terms of like what makes it valuable. Um, and for some of our clients, like we spend a lot of time engaging with people on social. So we know here are the people who are going to be interested. Um, I actually had a conversation yesterday about this that you know we were trying to figure out what type of content performed best on social. Well, when your social strategy isn't you have to have a full, you gotta be in. That's the big thing, right? Like 
you have to be all in and really engaging and this client isn't they're really just on there you know kind of pushing their stuff out um, but for clients who you know we're really in there and and connecting with others and, and chatting and you know making an actual social experience I'd say the content does much better um, to the question around promoting ebooks I mean really with anything uh, I, I love what Colin pointed about internal um, when you create something like an ebook or a guide or whatever it might be one of the first places we promote it is on those relevant blog posts on your own site, right? So we've created this asset, and now we want to push people who are coming to the blog through that journey to the next step. And that next step could be an ebook, it could be a guide. So we create these banners to push them there, right? And now we're able to get people through that funnel a little bit. Um, but earlier, I mentioned that I like to use tools like BuzzSumo, SEMrush, um, and what those tools do is they give you links to forums where people are asking questions. So you see places like Quora, um, you see places like uh, Captera, um, and I know that when people think of forums, we're like, all right, it's not 1996, but like they're very active, right? There, if you go to some forums, they're very active. People are asking questions. And I think there's a way to promote your content without being spammy. Um, but the uh, and, and so that's what we'll do, right? Is we'll put together um, profiles for our clients in these relevant places. We have them in there answering questions, engaging, so that when we do actually have something to promote, it makes sense for us to be able to go back and say, "Oh, hey!" And also, I saw you were asking this. Like, we've actually just answered this question. Here's the link to it, and and it's not so spammy, right? Um, the other piece of that is we do a little bit of syndication. So um, for some of our clients, we have medium for them um, just because there is an audience there. Uh, for other clients, we have them pushing out their, um, we'll have them write like an abstract about the post or about the asset and push it out on their own LinkedIn profile. So there's a huge thing about employee advocacy, right? And getting them to use their networks it's a really easy way to do it. Um, and if we write the abstract for them, they're much more likely to do it. So we try to find, you know, whether it's, you know, someone a little bit higher up in the organization who has a big network, um, we'll write that for them and, and have them push it out. So I think there's various ways to do it, but yeah, in and of itself, like that's the marketing side of content marketing. Like it's a huge thing. Um, it's really kind of its own thing. Sorry, I just went off on like a tangent there. <laughs> No, no, it's perfect. I've I've had B two B clients as well where we've had to uh, promote white papers and things like that. And and yeah, going back to your point about getting people internally to advocate for it really helped us. But also, you know, paid solutions. So pay per click advertising in Google on relevant topics and things like that absolutely made a difference, as you said. Yeah, and even with like the social side of things, like if it's something bigger you might just have to pay for it. Um, you know, we have clients who go to events and we might create an asset for that event and we're promoting it, you know, whether it's on Twitter or LinkedIn or even in paid search, targeting it toward that event. So, you know, when it comes to social, there, there's certainly an element there where you have to pay to play a little bit. Well, I'll tell you what, um, if you're listening to this podcast, um, you have to, watch us live next time because the quality of the interaction in the chat is just superb. We've got um, Casey Markey saying, I basically have advised customers to send out free poppies to influencers instead of Facebook ads. Good ROI so far. Stay tuned. Colin Gray, our guest saying, haha, great way to dog a team of influencer promoters. You don't get that humor anywhere else, dear listener. <laughs> No, it's only here in the SEM Rush channel. That's the only place you're ever likely to unfortunately stumble upon that. That or your dad. <laughs> you're welcome. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, saying that, Sam, that just about takes us to the end of episode 26 of season two. Just time for an actionable tip from each of our guests related to or not necessarily related to what we've been discussing so far. Let's go with Colin first. Colin, what's your actionable tip? I uh, would recommend uh, going away, if you're planning out your new content, try and think of um, something that works well for us and works well for many of our clients is uh, thinking out a season. So actually 
think out maybe six to 12 episodes on a topic that you've come up with. Find a question that you can answer and go really deep on it. Instead of just writing one blog post on it or one podcast episode or one video, break it down into really deep, really actionable episodes. Anything between five, six or up to 12 works really well, I think. And just break it down, answer each one and link them all together. There's just so many benefits to doing a season of content, whether it's a season of blog posts, you know, a series of blog posts or a season of a podcast. It works really well for me. Wonderful stuff where you can find Colin and his dulcet tones over at thepodcasthost.com. Next up, it's Casey. So Casey, what's your actionable tip? Yeah, I mean, I would say take a look at, we didn't really mention this, but take a look at what's already worked for you. Go into your analytics and start to see what performed well because going back to your channel, right? If you're, if you're trying to create something for search, take a look at your organic traffic over the past year and you'll start to see trends of here are things that are resonating with my audience. If it's social, take a look there, what's resonating. Um, and you know, Colin mentioned earlier, you know, you have 600 posts. Sometimes all you have to do is go back and you know, you can start revising some of those or, or taking them and make it better. So, you know, take a look at what you already have. I think it's a, a really underrated tactic. Fantastic. Um, you can find Casey over at comarketing.com. That's K-O marketing.com. And I've been Judith Lewis, your co-host. You can find me over at decapit.com. And I've been David Bain, your other co-host. You can find me over at digitalmarketingradio.com. We'll be recording the next episode, Season 2, Episode 27 of The Scoop in a week's time on the SEM Rush YouTube channel. That's on Wednesday, the 17th of April for a show that we'll be looking at at a UK Search Award winning campaign. Joining us for that episode will be Rod Richmond from Clean Digital and Robert Philbin from the Latitude Group. Sign up, watch that episode and other future episodes live over at semrush.com forward slash webinars. And of course, you can also catch all of the previous episodes over at semrush.com forward slash podcast. Thanks for joining us for this one, dear listener. Until next time, be fantabulous and do one thing that scares you. Adios. <laughs>